Hey, hey, welcome back for another ICS Defense Wars, my, uh, Defense Force, not Wars. My name is Dean Parsons, Certified Science Instructor for ICS 515 and 418. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about critical infrastructure incident response preparation. It's the best time as any to make sure that this critical piece of incident response is something that's on your radar and actually uh, uh, completed before an incident actually happens. So as always with ICS Defense Force, anything that we talk about in these sessions is applicable to many or all industrial control system sectors. So cookie factories to critical infrastructure, we have something here applicable and actionable for your sector specifically. So before we jump in, I wanna start today's episode with a question for you as you're coming on from wherever you are in the world. And the question really is this. What do you find the most important for your critical infrastructure incident response? Is it something that is a process? Is it a technology? Or are you hiring individuals now with key skills for critical infrastructure defense in the ICS and OT world? So we'll get to some of these things as we kind of go along, but really uh, urging you to, to put your thoughts and comments in the, the comments area so we can address some of those, uh, those concerns or questions that you might have as well. What's the most important for you? So of course, incident response is a large process that has technology, people associated with this. And for the first episode in this cycle, I guess, we're gonna be really talking about preparation and planning for ICS in incident response. But generally what you see on screen is an adapted or a changed version of what you may have seen from traditional incident response. This is specifically for industrial controls. So you'll see common things like planning that we're gonna talk about today, preparation. You're gonna see detection and identification of threats as well, but evidence acquisition is gonna be more important, I would wager here in ICS than in IT time critical analysis, and a change in containment, considering safety, and of course, eradication recovery, which you're probably welcome to see uh, in, in the uh, traditional IT, but also concerning safety in that eradication piece as well, just differentiating it from IT. And of course, lessons learned, a lot of applicable, actionable things, and then information sharing. So all of what you see here is an ICS version of incident response, including safety and other elements, which you might not see elsewhere. Well, now, before we jump right into the preparation phase and what we're going to suggest to focus on really starting out your preparation in your ICS program, it's going to be really talking about some constraints that we do see or challenges we see in ICS. Namely, there are the prioritization of different elements. There's also outside parties. We usually more heavily rely on an ICS, which is going to be critical for instant response and, of course, some of the challenges uh, that we see with some of the systems that we maintain for safety and reliability. So in the priorities category, we see safety, of course, right? Anybody coming to ICS Defense Force has heard me say safety a thousand times, and I'll say it again a thousand times in the next episode because it is goal number one. Beyond safety is obviously the reliability of these systems and, of course, the business aspect, why an organization produces X product anyway. Beyond that, though, again, it's the outside parties. I really want to dive into vendors. We do heavily rely on vendors in ICS more so than in other areas, in, so in IT as an example. And these vendors are tasked with sometimes fully maintaining portions of your operational technology assets, maintaining them, upgrading them, programming them like ladder logic and whatnot. And so in a recovery situation during its response, they may be critical to restoration, uh, but uh, we're gonna talk about the preparation phase in a second. Challenges, again, legacy systems, as we're all well aware, unique systems as well, proprietary systems, which brings me to a critical point in incident response for ICS, which is data collection or forensics analysis. Now, later on in this series, we're going to talk about tools and, and approaches to get the critical information to do quick triage, but there are challenges with that. We do see some systems not having the right data available to us during incidents, uh, but we are getting better. So we're going to walk through all of those things. Another quick reminder, have you seen any of those challenges we just talked about in your ICS program? Drop those in the comments. We'll address those shortly as well. So let's jump into preparation now that we have a little bit of understanding about some of the things we're dealing with in ICS, but more importantly, why it's critical to prepare for instant response in ICS and in OT. Now, this is a 10 or 15 minute segment, so we can only focus on so much content. We're going to absolutely assume any organization or critical infrastructure already has established ICS asset inventory and visibility into the network at least. 
Of course, yes, there's endpoint detection and all that. But we want to make sure at least we have the network visibility. Now, specifically control system network connections and uh, commands as well in, in the packet from protocol. So with these two assumptions, the thing we're going to do with preparation is really these top five things here, actionable uh, data right here. Obviously, having a plan that's well established is going to be critical. It's not necessarily just a written down policy or plan. It's going to be something that you're going to execute as well. In executing this plan specifically about your control system, considering all of the engineering assets and safety, of course, in that you have number two. Within the plan, you're going to have defined and, and roles, responsibilities that should be communicated well before an incident. And those things usually shake out when you're planning, creating number one, or actually executing an incident response plan as well. So I want to dive into a couple of these in more detail in today's episode. Beyond number two, which we will come back to, is obviously train specific security defenders who understand the industrial control environment, the critical infrastructure protocols, which we've talked about many times in these episodes. And of course, understanding your engineering. Now, what I mean by understanding your engineering, again, we're talking about incidents here, which could be emergency situations. So number four, which is understanding your engineering aspects, really talks about if you're in a steel plant, for example, uh, what happens if the blast furnace in your steel plant does not cool down appropriately? Do you have a safety system that regulates the blast furnace and cooling it down properly so there's no physical destruction or damage. So understanding the engineering aspect is critical for incident response. And I would say it's critical as well as a skill set for industrial control system cyber defenders as well. Now, the other one here I want to go into deep in a second is number five, having a cyber defensible position. This is in the preparation phase we're talking about here, but ultimately you will execute number five, the cyber defensible position, once you are in the middle of an incident and you've declared uh, an incident inside your ICS or OT environment. This allows you to, um, uh, I guess, section off your environment to continue to fight through an attack, maintaining safety and reliability. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to jump into these two for the next few minutes and discuss a little bit of, um, of some of the tricks of the trade about what we should really look for in preparation for incident response with regards to defined roles and responsibility, communicating those out, and we'll walk through exactly what we mean when we talk about a cyber defensible position. With the roles and responsibilities, of course, you may have these roles chunked up into different tasks in your workforce already. But of course, we are going to start with in, in, in the incident response director. This is usually the role or individual that's going to be interfacing with executive leadership. That means the VP of engineering. It means CEO, for example. These folks who are the stakeholders and owners and operators of the facilities that may have an incident in critical infrastructure. These individuals as a director, uh, response director, is really going to have a situational awareness. Talked about earlier that engineering understanding, this individual should understand if a generator in my power system goes down, what does that mean for the business? What does it mean for the environment? What does it mean for the region that we're supplying power in this organization? So situational awareness, not only on the engineering side, but also about the attack that's happening as well, which is closely related and aligned with the lead responder. They communicate like this fairly regularly, lead responder up to director and back down and so on and so forth. Now, the lead responder is really the person that understands the technical aspects of incident response, the engineering side as well. So think Windows OT devices, but also think PLCs, RTUs, lower level Purdue. But also they guide the individuals which report to them to do the tactical uh, data acquisition, analysis, and so on and so forth. And those individuals are, or the roles are, the incident handlers. Now, when we talk about incident handlers in ICS, we are talking about folks that are in the field, which could be engineering folks in the field, programming logic controllers, uh, doing upgrades, network architects inside the ICS, but of course, ICS cybersecurity defenders as well. You see, in ICS, in incident response, it's not just one team you're relying on to do incident response. There's many teams, and the incident handler will be conducting data acquisition with engineering physical access to site, so safety uh, teams probably going to be part of that. And also, they're going to be scoping the environment, getting the data, scoping and understanding the data, and understanding the threats that they're facing currently. And they're going to report that up to the lead responder, who will then provide options, or I guess, uh, of what can be done or what is happening to the director, uh, and so on and so forth. 
Now, the last but certainly not least is a call out to those other groups we usually rely on as part of incident response in ICS, which can be the fire and security, physical fire and security groups inside of an organization. Also external as well, going to be relying possibly on law enforcement, also external parties for additional aid, such as physical first aid as well in emergency response situations. And again, a call out to vendors as well to help in these situations to perhaps uh, identify uh, some areas where proprietary software could exist or proprietary logs could exist, which you may need to get access to. So heavily, again, relying on vendors in certain situations in the preparation and execution phase of incident response. So those are generally the roles and responsibilities. Now, the one last thing I wanna talk about just before we get into the comments is that ICS cyber safe or defensible position. And yes, it's totally castle position or turtle mode, we call it, either one works. But really to, to make it effective, is really to understand what access you have to an environment and how do you reduce the risk surface during an incident to ultimately fight through an attack in industrial controls, prioritizing safety. You see in IT, for example, um, some incidents could be there's malware on a system or there's remote access. Disconnecting that, wiping the system, patching it, redeploying it is, is, is a possible way to do that. But generally in ICS, it's not something that we typically do. We fight through the attack more so it seems while preserving the the, uh, the industrial control processes. Uh, so with regards to this castle scenario, the ICS cyber position, we're gonna be really talking about disconnecting external sources into the industrial control environment that may mean remote access. So during an incident, as an example, your staff, your uh, engineering staff could be potentially going to a site to operate instead of operating remotely. Uh, so that changes a lot of the workforce um, expectations as well. Beyond that, of course, in internal to the ICS, in this position, you may do further segmentation as well. So if there's a segment that does have a contaminant in it, that's perhaps in the DMZ 3.5, for example, that's maybe not necessary to operate the process at that time. You would not have data historian data, for example, but you could reduce the ability uh, of a threat spreading in that way. Also modifying any protocols on site to get access to site. So physical changes as well to site procedures, obviously digitally disabling unused systems or unused network services. So daemons or web applications or you know things of that nature, or even on PLCs that are not usable or required, further hardening could help in situations like this as well. And of course, last but certainly not least, again, safety comes up. It's verifying that the safety instrumented systems are continuing to function as expected and isolated if needed. Now, again, we've only been talking a little bit about some of the things in preparation phase for industrial control systems. We have not yet talked about data acquisition, uh, the containment, and, and so on and so forth, and threat and environment manipulation. And they're going to be coming up in further episodes. So what I do want to do is I want to pivot to seeing what you guys have thoughts on about this, see if there's any questions here as well. Because I know that you know containment is, is certainly uh, top of mind for most, but I definitely want to see if there's any questions with regards to the preparation phase as well. So there's a lot of folks on again today. Welcome aboard, everybody. This is fantastic. Wow, again, from all over the world, process control engineers as well. This is fantastic. So it looks like you have really good comments. Uh, yeah. So one comment here is identify critical assets where incidents, if uh, they do happen, will hit the most. That's a great, great point there as well, critical assets. And we did cover critical assets, but very quickly in 10 seconds or less, the things you wanna prioritize first and foremost based on threat intelligence is obviously the human machine interface, the uh, engineering workstation, of course, uh, the PLCs, ladder logic controllers, all of those kinds of things, the data historian as well. Great, great point on that, absolutely. Um, all right. Yeah. Know the environment. Know the network. Absolutely. Uh, so thanks so much for, for uh, bringing me back to The Matrix, the first one, where Neo walks through the door. No spoilers, really. Walks through the door. He meets the Oracle for the first time. And there's a sign above his head in the Oracle's kitchen. And uh, he, he talks about uh, knowing thyself, timidnosis, which is exactly your comment there. Knowing what assets you have knowing how to protect those assets, but also knowing how the adversary targets those assets. Well ahead of the game there. Um, very, very cool. Okay, so um, looking at additional comments here as well. Uh, you guys are coming from everywhere. Yeah, what is a typical timeline for detection to response to resolution? 
Super great question. What I will say in general is in IT, we do see that uh, timeline very rapid. We do see it from, it could be 10 minutes to two or three hours rapid pace in IT, generally in the industrial control space to get there to set up a, a, a cyber threat and have impact. It's generally much, much longer. Uh, so in general, impacting attacks, I'll say in ICS is really weeks to months out, which is great from a detection perspective, because now we have the upper hand. We don't usually have that in, in any security realm. So we have the upper hand in ICS to do more detection with that longer window where the adversary typically has to learn about the environment more so to actually cause impact. Uh, great question. All right. Yeah, so uh, another quick question before we end off this uh, episode, incident response plan and playbook relationship. So great point on that. And of course, the incident response execution and the playbooks are going to be driven from things in your sector. Threat intelligence is going to be part of the incident response aspect when we talk about threat detection uh, and identification in the next episode. Great point on that. All right. Okay, good stuff. So if I didn't get to any of your questions in this time, I will follow up on the medium that we uh, put these recorded sessions out to. But thank you for continuing to uh, hang out with us live. And I do want to welcome you to the next episode, which we have as well, which is incident response detection and identification. So please uh, connect with us then as well. Until that time, hopefully this helps with your ICS preparation phase for incident response. Thanks very much. Thank you.